All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Kate, and with me is Lee Halliday, uh, hey, senior, senior engineering manager at Wrapbook. Hey, Lee, how's it going? Good, Kate. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, yeah, so this is unusual because uh, usually I go through like this kind of conversation where I'm like, oh, I know who you are because of Twitter and I've seen all your stuff, but you and I have actually talked before <laughs> about YouTube. Yeah. So uh, it's good to see you again. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you as well. And I've actually written articles for LogRocket too. That's right. And yes, you have made videos for LogRocket. You've written for LogRocket. Um, so, mm -hmm. so we are old, old friends. Um, sure. So yeah, maybe just tell our audience a little bit about yourself and um, kind of what you're working on. Sure. Um, so name is Lee, like Kate just said, but I'm located just outside of Toronto, up north in Canada, um, where um, I'm working remotely. So so uh, I'm working from my home office and I'm switching a little bit more into the engineering management side. So I, I've been doing development for close to 20 years now. I would say I did about my first 10 years with PHP and building apps out with that. And then I would say the last 10, I've been focusing on Ruby on Rails for like a full stack application. And maybe in the last five, really focusing the front end part of that into React. So I've been developing for a while, but I would say in the last um, five or six months since I switched to Wrapbook, I've been focusing on engineering management and building out and help manage um, right now two teams of engineers. Yeah, and you also have an awesome YouTube channel. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, that's a there's a funny story behind that. Um, so my wife is a lawyer, and she comes from like legal background. And when she came to Canada from from Colombia. Um, she was trying to figure out, like, do I go back into law in Canada and become like a lawyer in this new country as well? Or do I explore other careers such as software engineering? So she ended up doing a, a boot camp and she was learning React. And I thought, hey, I'm going to make her a little video trying to show how MobX works, the state management tool for React. So I recorded it really for her and just threw it up on YouTube as a way to like share the link with her. And then I just sort of forgot about it for like months. And then I came back and I like people were subscribing to me and people were starting to view the this video. And I was like, oh, shoot, like I didn't do this on purpose, but maybe I should make more videos. So I I just started recording a few more. And then at some point, the channel like grew to the point where I started to like make it a goal to produce one video a week. And that was over two years ago now. So I, I hit the 100 video plus mark. And um, yeah, it hasn't hasn't really had like crazy like startup unicorn growth. It's sort of been like a consistent growth over the last couple of years. So as long as I keep putting out videos, people seem to keep subscribing, which is awesome. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. And you have um, over like 22,000 subscribers, I think I saw this morning. Yeah, it's been growing. I think, I think especially like at the start of the pandemic, when like a lot of people had more time for various reasons, like maybe people were working from home more and they weren't doing the commute anymore or just looking to upgrade their skills to maybe look for a new job. Um, the channel started to grow sort of around that time period because I think I might have been around 10,000 at that point. So it's 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 been growing pretty well over the last year. I don't know where it will get to, but <laughs> I guess yeah. the sky's the limit. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Um, so I guess I'm curious, like, you know, why why specifically video? Why specifically YouTube? Because you also have some articles, but it seems like you do you write less frequently, and it's more videos. Yeah. Um, so I think. One of the reasons, like aside from the story about creating that first MobX video for my wife, um, at work, I actually didn't do a lot of front end development. So I worked um, when I started to learn React, I worked at a company called Flipgive and we had a Ruby on Rails application that was predominantly a server rendered app. So our, our front end had at the time it was jQuery and we started to transition 
pieces of individual pages to React. And sort of over the course of a few years, basically the whole front end was React. But I normally worked on the back end side of that. So I was building out the GraphQL API to help support the front end developers doing their work along with our React Native mobile app. So I used a lot of the videos I made as a way to basically teach myself these skills that I wasn't necessarily doing day in, day out at work because I was, um, yeah, I was just more comfortable with the back end working with databases and Ruby on Rails. Um, and I wanted to be able to contribute to the work that the front end team was doing. So I would say that's why I focused more on on um, this. And I just thought it was like a nice format. Like typically what I do is I'll think of something I want to learn. So I don't even necessarily know how to do that thing. Or maybe I've never even used that tool. And I play around with it a bit to, to learn sort of the basics of how it works. And then I come up with a quick demo sort of some goal to work towards. Like I'm going to build this demo to build a simple like leaderboard for users or something like that. So I build it out once and then I basically delete the code and immediately afterwards I re-record myself building the same thing um, for YouTube. Then I just upload it. So it's still like fresh in my mind and it sort of allows me to like live code, but I'm not having to spend like six hours figuring this stuff out. Like I can sort of just code it through because it's fresh in my head. I still make mistakes all the time and I just leave them in because that's that's part of it. Like even though I had just literally built this thing, I still mess up and uh, name variables wrong and have to stumble around. But uh, no, it's fun. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like writing as well, but uh, and they both take a lot of time. Like I would say... Doing a 20, 30 minute YouTube video probably takes at least four to six hours of work for that. And writing an, an article can can sometimes take that or longer. Like if and most of the time is in the research ahead of time and like coming up with a good demo that I can show off, both for like writing and YouTube. It's all about like understanding and then creating something. And once I've done that, the writing and the actual recording is sort of the easy part. Because at that point, I'm just sort of telling people what I just finished learning myself. And that's generally sure. the approach I take for that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and so actually, um, as I mentioned, Lee's done some videos for our YouTube channel. Um, go check them out. Uh, but um, when we posted them, um, some comments were even like, uh, since it was you know on the Lock Rocket channel, um, and I think, I don't think there was a couple, you didn't have your face on them. So like there was, it was only your voice. Um, and in the comments, people were like, oh, hey, that's Lee Halliday. What's up? Love your videos, man. That's funny. <laughs> so, um, that's funny. You definitely have a good following and they can even recognize you just uh, from your voice. <laughs> no, it's, it's great. Like I've seen people sort of following me right from the beginning. And I've seen people like message that they've, gotten jobs possibly because of some of the concept they've learned in the YouTube videos I do. Um, so that's really rewarding, like to see other people succeed from something that I was basically just doing to teach myself a technology. It's, it's sort of like a win-win. Um, and I think that's like a good approach in general for an engineer, like share what you learn and share as you're learning. Like you don't have to be the, the creator of React just to be able to teach React. Like it can just be, hey, I'm learning something. And more often than not, you're, you're closer to the person that's learning than the absolute expert of that technology. So you can share like the same roadblocks that you ran into that someone else might run into because you literally just solved those problems yourself. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, and like I think... It also helps out your career as an engineer to to basically share your knowledge. Like there's not really, at least in my opinion, there's not a benefit to keeping it internal and just like saving it for yourself. And like, no, the more you share what you know, it actually goes back um, and, and helps you at the same time. Yeah. 
Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, we just actually talked to um, James Quick on the podcast, and yeah. um, he was saying like a, a big part of his workflow is like he learns something, then he'll do it himself, and then teach it, and like he does that with like every concept. Um, yeah, that he comes yeah, across. I'm the exact same way. Um, yeah, just share what you're learning and what you know. That's that's basically all there is to it. it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, yeah. So kind of along those lines, um, I guess I noticed uh, it seems like you had like a very clear, like, so we have MobX videos, serverless videos, React hooks videos. And then it seems like in the last couple of months, you've kind of been experimenting with some different technologies, um, different concepts. Um, I guess kind of, hmm. um, you know, where are you pulling those those topics from? Honestly, I'm just covering topics that interest me. Um and th the funny thing is it doesn't always line up with the videos that are the most popular um, or that are, yeah, like sometimes the hardest videos to make perform the worst. And, and uh, but I've just basically been, if it's interesting to me, I'm going to learn about it and I'm going to record it. And hopefully other people will follow along if they find it interesting too. Um, like my best videos do are, on maps, like Google Maps, Mapbox, but I can't just create, keep creating m map videos for the rest of my life. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I have to like branch out and I'm trying to do more like full stack development because I love when a developer is a full stack developer because that means they can take an app from like initializing it to shipping it and building out everything in between. And you don't have to necessarily rely on, oh, there's going to be a backend team that's going to build out my, my API or vice versa. Oh, I just do the backend. I need somebody else to help me with the front end. Um, it's really cool to have the ability to ship an app from start to finish. So instead of just focusing on React, I've been trying to tie it in more to things you might do on the backend. Um, Especially with Next.js, you don't need to learn a separate like Ruby on Rails for your backend. Like Next.js has the ability with the serverless um, API functions to build out the pieces of a backend you need to be able to like store a cache in Redis, to store data in a Postgres database, to create your own GraphQL API that the front end can pull from. So I've been trying to do a little bit more of that intersection between the front end and the back end. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have a Next.js course act out, actually. Um, tell us a little bit about yeah. that. That's basically the same theme I was just talking about, where I wanted to produce a course that was more about building and shipping an app. So in this case, what we do is we it's basically like like if you're looking to buy a home and you're going to like realtor.com or .ca or whatever, and you're seeing a map of like where all the homes are, it's like a really scaled down simple version of that. So it has a map that shows the homes on it. So we build out both the front end and the back end of this app. Um, so on the front end, we use uh, React using TypeScript, Next.js, um, Apollo for the GraphQL part of it. And then we also build out a backend, which is the GraphQL API from that perspective. And we use um, Prisma to, to connect to our database, which is a Postgres database. And we make sure that users are authenticated and then we deploy it to Vercel after. So we basically go from nothing to, hey, here's an entire application where users can log in, upload a house, put that house on the map and have it display that those details to users. So like some things are simplified because uh, it, like it's hard to do everything in in 4 hours of content or whatever, but it's it's sure. pretty much what you would need to be able to ship an app yourself uh, start to finish. Very cool. Awesome. Do you ever get flagged for like accessing all these map APIs? <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, so one of the first videos in the course is we basically go and we set up like actual accounts on those different map APIs. Oh, okay. So, okay. <laughs> so weirdly enough, we actually connect to both Google 
maps and map box in this video. Okay. We do map box for like the actual like visual map itself, but then we use Google for their Google Places API. So being able mm -hmm. to like start typing an address and it gives you all of the different options. And basically what you're trying to do in that is to get a latitude and longitude that allows you to then place that location on the map. So we both, so we sort of use them together, but they're all with like legit accounts. Um, but I was trying to find accounts that had free plans so that as we're building out this full stack app, yes, you need to sign up for five or six different accounts to be able to do mapping, do authentication, deploy it to Vercel, um, host a database somewhere. I tried to find places that would have a free plan so that it wouldn't cost people extra money just to, to work on their skills. Yeah, um, that makes sense. One of the coolest things is um, inspired by Wes Boss, fellow Canadian up here, is uh, I tried to put a purchasing power parity plan out so that the course has one price, but depending where you come from, you can get discounts to hopefully make that price more affordable given your location. People have all sorts of different, um, yeah, developers get paid differently all over the world. So I wanted to try to make it as fair as possible for, for people. Um, so yeah, just there, there's a, a link on the website, but you can also just message me and I'm more than happy to, to help make it affordable for you. That's awesome. Uh, Wes Boss is actually coming on. Uh, he's We're going to record with him in two days at the time of this recording. So, oh, no way. Um, he'll, I've taken yeah, he'll be many on the episode of his, after you, I think. I've taken many of his courses myself, so I highly recommend anyone. They're super high quality. He's hilarious. He's got a great podcast with Scott Talinsky. Um, so, yeah, Wes Boss is, gets my full approval. <laughs> awesome. plus, plus, he's from about an hour away, so... Got to support oh, cool. the, local, the local people. <laughs> totally, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Well, so I guess with uh, you know video content, um, I know you kind of have, have said that you have uh, experimented topic wise with what is interesting to you. Um, you do also have quite the spread of like time, so like you know you experiment with like long form videos, short form videos. Um, I guess kind of is there a rhyme or reason to that as well. No, I don't think there is. Um, <laughs> I try to keep them on the shorter side, meaning like 10 to 20 minutes sort of thing. A, because they're way easier for me to record. Like if I'm going to be live coding 50 minutes of content, that's so like stressful for me to keep in my head. Like, like I have, I actually have a, like a widescreen monitor sort of behind my computer and I have like all these snippets of like code that I'm trying to like keep in my head. So like as much as possible, I'm typing and I'm just recreating it. But some of the like config stuff, like there's no way anyone can memorize that. I had to do a ton of Googling to figure that out for the first time. And to save it from being a six hour video, I had to just sort of skip that part of me learning all of those things. Otherwise, nobody would watch anything. But um, I guess it, it's all about the concept, like how how big is the demo or how big is the concept that I'm trying to show? Um, and sometimes it's just like, hey, here's a here's a state management library. Um, we're going to do a simple like to do list or something and we can get it done in 15 minutes. But if it's a longer demo where like, we're going to be storing data in a, in a backend. We're going to be displaying it on a map. We have to build out all of these pages. That takes longer. But yeah, it's it's so hard to do. And it's not my full-time job. It's something I do sort of waking up at five in the morning before I actually have to work. So the more I like overextend myself, it it's sort of like the harder it is to stay consistent because then I end up sort of burning myself out um, and spending like weekends coding. And then I just find myself like I need more balance in my life. I need to do things other than like working all day in tech and then like waking up at five to do recordings on YouTube and then 
spend all Saturday learning a new topic, it just becomes too much. So trying totally. to find like the balance for that is difficult. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, kind of another direction. Um, I noticed on your YouTube channel, you don't put your face on any of the thumbnails. <laughs> and um, we just had this conversation with Jessica Chan that she's like, I always put my face on the thumbnails because whenever I don't, then it's like noticeably gets fewer views. <laughs> and there's a lot of Shoot. face thumbnails on YouTube. <laughs> oh, I, I'm probably just meaning I'm I'm bad at marketing myself is, is <laughs> I think what the honest answer is. Like, uh, yeah, I, I have no reason why I haven't. I have a few that have my face on there, but for the most part, that's like the the marketing and graphic side of things isn't something even the editing i don't really enjoy that side of things and so i try to just do what will allow me to get it done quickly because if if it takes me 6 hours to like research and record if i had to do another 6 hours of like editing coming up with uh youtube covers and stuff like that I just don't think I'd honestly do any, like I wouldn't put any videos up because I, it would just be too much. So like I pretty much do zero editing on my videos. I do one take like start to finish and just crop it a little bit. Um, if I get stuck for like two, three minutes and it's not like something useful to share, I may cut those like two, three minutes of like fumbling about but for the most part, it's just one cut start to finish. And then I, it's like literally just live coding and trying to describe like what I'm doing as I'm typing. And then I quickly put together like a YouTube cover that it's basically like copy and paste the other one, change the text, like change a color and go. I should really focus more on marketing because maybe like that's, one of the differences of like channels that grow more quickly than others. Um, yeah, but that's definitely not my strength. So I mean, it's working for you. I just, I was just curious. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's good to know. Um, yeah. Cause I haven't really done much research or anything. It's, it's mostly just me. I don't know, figuring stuff out on my own. Maybe I should do that experiment. You know what YouTube needs actually they need a B testing for video cover images. So you could have like one as a face shot of like, it's always like you're, you're scared of the code. Like you're like, ah, yeah. that, that <laughs> yeah. face yeah. and, uh, or you're surprised. <laughs> it's always like you're surprised at something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then you could a B test that versus just like, like text, like what are you covering in the video? Right. And then YouTube could just pick the one that's performing better. Um, I don't know why they haven't done that. So maybe if they listen to this podcast, they can. Yeah, uh, someone from YouTube is listening. We have some <laughs> ideas for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it yeah that'd be like great. It'd be easy to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so I guess um, you know, obviously, you're like experimenting with a lot of different things. Um, you have a Next.js course. Um, we actually just talked to Guillermo Rauch uh, last week. Oh, awesome. Um, very exciting. Is yeah. The best. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It was great to have him on the podcast. Um, I guess I'm curious kind of what technologies are you excited about? Uh, it's almost 2022, which is crazy. So I'm going to say what, what technologies are you excited about in um, 2022? I'm still excited about Next.js. Um, for me, like, like create react app and even to some extent, Gatsby, I was always like, I don't like being sort of limited to the front end. And I know Gatsby has a uh, serverless functions you can add in now, but I like, I come from that world of like a rails backend, which is like this one full stack framework that handles everything you need on the back end and the front end at the same time. I love that concept. And I love that in Next.js, you can just throw on a couple endpoints to your React code on the front end without very little effort at all. Um, I'm also excited about, though, um, 
Blaze, um, which is built on top of, um, you know, it's not Blaze, it's Blitz, right? Uh, Blitz, next. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Blitz, it's built on top of Next.js, but they have added more of that, like, integrated backend in for, like, uh, data support. and So that excites me because I love that stack becoming more full stack. Um, Redwood JS is really cool as well. It's created by one of the original you or not YouTube uh, GitHub creators, and who also comes from a Ruby on Rails backend because that's what GitHub is made in. And he's taking the approach as well, where it's it's actually a mono repo where you have two applications inside of your one repo, one for the front end and one for the back end. And but it's sort of there's a nice sort of seamless connection between the front end and the back end. But it also means if at some reason you need a different back end or a different front end in the future, you don't need to throw the whole thing away. You can sort of just stick with the part of the application that you need going forward. It also, for me, works a little bit better um, if you're building out multiple applications, like a web app and a mobile app. Um, Blitz is really cool, but it, it seems quite tied to the web front end. Whereas if you're building like a React Native um, app and a web app, you sort of want them both to connect to a separate backend that can support both of those different applications. So I think Redwork fits really well with that sort of idea of having multiple front ends connecting to a single backend. But they also make sort of out of the box, they take care of routing, they take care of building a GraphQL API, they take care of um, all the annoying things you have to do on the front end anytime you're loading data, like mm -hmm. check if it's in a loading state, is it in an error state, is it finished loading, but it, it found no no uh, items from the back end, and you have to handle, there's like five or six different states. It has this unique concept called cells, I think it's called, where you sort of just define like, what should you display when it's loading, when it's loaded, but it loaded nothing, when it's loaded something, um, if it failed. So you just define all these little components and uh, Redwood handles which one to show based on what the loading state is in. Um, so I'm really pumped about that as well. It seems like a really cool framework. Yeah, that's awesome. We had um, Brandon uh, Bayer from Blitz.js on the podcast very early. We also had uh, David Price from Redwood.js on the podcast. Oh, no way. Super, so you've like, talked to everyone early. already. <laughs> yeah. So we had, it was our first couple episodes were like very Jamstack heavy. Um, yeah. Kind of so just that's who uh, was interested in coming on. So that it was, yeah, uh, super excited about it. And um, we, we have episodes uh, talking to them too. Yeah. Like I, and I don't want it to sound like I'm, down on one versus another, they both are really interesting and they both have pros and cons. Like the cool thing about Blitz is if you're comfortable with Next.js, you feel right at home because it's just built on top of Next.js. So as Next.js gets better and updates, um, like Guillermo and the team at um, Vercel's doing, like they're putting out an incredible, incredible amount of um, innovation on that on that platform you get all of those benefits as well and you can just sort of feel right at home in that environment and but redwood took this like completely different approach where they're just going to sort of tackle the problem the problem from a different perspective so they're both really interesting to me yeah yeah definitely and um yeah i'll include the uh the links to those episodes um Sweet. in the show notes as well <laughs> awesome um Cool. Well, um, okay. This is a um, not related to tech question, but I was looking at your LinkedIn profile before this, <laughs> and um, you have it's uh, you've lived in two South American countries. You speak fluent yeah. Spanish. Um, you've taught skateboarding. Um, <laughs> you ha have a, t a you have a coffee growing certificate from the Colombian government, <laughs> <laughs> which is very yeah. cool. Um, 
and you enjoy brewing kombucha and um, camping, which I appreciate that as a LinkedIn bio. Um, <laughs> I guess I'm curious, like... So I've I, retired from kombucha brewing. Okay. Um, <laughs> because I had an unfortunate explosion in my kitchen. Um, so the way kombucha works, I'll keep this short, is the like the bacteria eats the sugars, which gets converted into carbonation. Okay. So I had this thing brewing in my cupboard, in the kitchen, and then all of a sudden I heard like this gunshot sound go off in the kitchen downstairs. So I come downstairs and there's just like tea everywhere. Like my entire yeah. kitchen is an explosion of tea and glass and tea stains really easily and our floor was like, no, it was rough. So I, I, reti I retired from kombucha brewing for now. Maybe okay. I'll take it up again in the future, <laughs> but, but I got to stay safe and I can't wreck the kitchen anymore. I had to repaint <laughs> half of it. So, <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> well, yeah, and the, uh, and the coffee thing, I was living in Colombia for a while while I was dating my wife and they off the Colombian government offers these really cool, like free online education you can take. So I signed up for like the how to be a coffee grower course the tricky thing though was like i do speak spanish but like i i had never done an entire course in spanish when i have to like read and write and speak like spanish the whole way through but it was cool like do i remember anything 10 years later i don't think so but uh, <laughs> but it was cool at it. the time yeah. yeah how long does it last the certification I, i'm not sure i haven't looked into it <laughs> Just yeah. curious. The, yeah. Coffee coffee doesn't grow up here in Canada anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> we cool. just have like well, pine, pine, pine trees and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. I just, it just stood out to me when I was uh, looking up uh, your LinkedIn stuff. I always, um, I was just talking to uh, B. Dougie from GitHub last week. I interviewed him. Cool. And um, we ended up just talking about pizza and Beyonce for a while. <laughs> so I just always. So Pizza, pizza's my next like uh, hobby that I want to get into. I want to okay. get like a <laughs> a backyard pizza oven for my house, and and figure out how to make like high quality pizzas. So, uh, but yeah, I gotta wait a little bit for that. I'm in an apartment now, so I need first a house, and then uh, then I can get the pizza oven. Yeah, and then you can do a YouTube channel for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I can expand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll probably expand <laughs> my weight as well. <laughs> I've had eating all those pizzas. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah, is there anything that uh, you want our listeners to know about upcoming um, tutorials, courses? Um, yeah, I mean, so if people are interested, you can check out my course. We'll, as I mentioned, we build a full stack uh, Next.js application where you're authentication, maps, GraphQL, Prisma, TypeScript, lots of cool concepts we go into and you don't need any sort of prior experience with those. I'll explain everything from scratch. And if you go to next.leehalliday.com, I have a link to, the, to where you can buy it and also where you can um, use the purchasing power parity to bring the price and make it more affordable for, forever where you're, for wherever you're at. Um, and also right now, I, um, I'm working as an engineer manager at Wrapbook, so I help manage two teams right now, and we, we're sort of the full stack teams at the company. There's a couple other teams that focus more on the back end, but we touch everything, and we are hiring right now. We're looking to grow the engineering team by quite a bit, so if you're interested, head on over to Wrapbook, that's uh, W-R-A-P-Book.com, and go to the career section and and there's quite a few openings. So it'd be cool to get in touch and hear from some people that have heard this podcast. And that's a uh, remote in Canada and US. So wherever you are in Canada and US, it's fine. Awesome. Yeah, we'll include all those links um, in our show notes uh, so you can check those out. And awesome. um, awesome, Lee. Thanks so much. It's always a pleasure. And, Thank you, Kate. Uh, nice chatting with you. We'll see you soon, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Take care. Have a good day. <laughs>